semesters is being presented as a collaboration between the Center for Nanotechnology and Society at Arizona State University and by Sigma Xi. CNSASU is a research center funded by the National Science Foundation to study the societal, ethical, and environmental implications of nanotechnology research and development. As part of our mission, CNSASU sponsors monthly science cafes together in partnership with the Arizona Science Center. The cafes bring you, the public, together with university scientists to discuss how science and technology affect our lives. They are opportunities for you to not only learn from the people who produce and study science, but also for you to educate them by sharing your opinions, making comments, and voicing your concerns. Our presenters this evening are Dr. Bill Kimball and Dr. Amy Stone. Dr. Kimball is the director of the Institute of Human Origins at ASU. He conducts field laboratory and theoretical research in paleoanthropology, specializing in hominid evolution in Africa. Dr. Stone is a professor in the School of Human Evolution and Social Change. Her research focuses on primate genetics, including both humans and non-humans. And in 1996, she was part of the group that sequenced the first mitochondrial DNA fragment from a Neanderthal. She was recently included in a group of exemplar faculty named by ASU President Michael Crow for her dedication in both teaching and research. We will begin the evening by hearing from Dr. Kimball. Thank you very much and welcome everyone. It's a uh, beautiful, somewhat warm Friday afternoon and I know you'll probably be doing other things, which undoubtedly you'll get to, but I appreciate you to have as well. Um, my job the, uh, this evening for the next few minutes is to set context for you, talk a little bit about what are the Neanderthals. And in order to do that, I have made a deeply entrenched cultural bias about Neanderthals, one that stems from the 19th century reconstructions of the very first fossil discoveries in Germany and France of specimens being stooped over with a stupid looking face, violent tendencies as reflected in these this movie poster and some of these cartoonish reconstructions of Neanderthals in the early 20th century. Turns out that many of those reconstructions were based on pathological specimens, one in particular from France, which had spinal deformities resulting in what was undoubtedly during life a stooped posture, but was misinterpreted by anatomists and anthropologists of the day as reflecting this ape-like, brutish, presentation of the body, the face, and so forth. If we move ahead into the 1950s, the post-war years, and into the 1960s, we find a dramatically different view of Neanderthals. Someone, if you dressed him up in a suit and tie, maybe give him a haircut and a shave, you could put him on a subway in New York, maybe, and he would blend in reasonably well. Sometimes, it was said, perhaps, they would even reflect some more well-known people. <laughs> but we have represented by these two images, cultural biases, if you will. On the one hand, the Neanderthal is the violent, brutish, 
stupid human ancestor, and on the other, someone who is a lot like us, but just in need of a trip. Neither of these views permit us to take Neanderthals in their own, in their own right. And that's what I want to do for the next couple of minutes. Maybe. <laughs> so, thank you. So, who indeed were the Neanderthals? They had brains the same size as those of us in this room. They were smart. They had a very sophisticated stone tool culture that required planning and foresight to manufacture. They were big game hunters, extremely proficient hunters, probably better than anyone in this room could do if they practiced their lifetime. They took care of the elderly and the sick. And we know this because we have the skeletal remains of individuals who lived past traumatic injury and degenerative joint disease. And they buried their dead. Sometimes, arguably, with grave ritual offerings placed in some of the graves. So these were people who, if we imagine life 40, 50, 60,000 years ago, would reflect a lot of the characteristics that we consider today uniquely human, and yet we are the only species alive today of human. Right? But Neanderthals are like us. They are not us. Neanderthals are like us, like chimpanzees are like us, with the difference being that Neanderthals are on our side of the division of the great line of evolution that unites the African apes and humans, and much later in time, of course, and therefore they share many more characteristics with us than you would predict a chimpanzee does. Looking at Neanderthals is kind of like going to the fun house and looking in the fun house mirror. You see something that looks kind of like you, but it's not really like you, at least you hope not. Oops. Where did they live? They dominated during the time they were on the planet everywhere from Western, sorry, Western Asia, Uzbekistan, for example, down into Western Asia, into Iran, which is today Iran, Syria, Iraq, into the Middle East, which is today Israel, and some of the occupied territories, in through Southern Europe, in, up the Iberian Peninsula of Spain and Portugal, into Western Europe and Central Europe, where the best known examples are clustered in sites in Spain and France and Germany. And they lived at a time, as we will see, that was dominated by the comings and goings of glacial age Europe. So they lived on the fringe of extremely cold, arid conditions. And this, this period of time is very late in human evolution, long after the primitive, small-brained Australopithecus species had disappeared, long after the gigantic, toothed, heavy-chewing Paranthropus species had disappeared, and long after the earliest species that we can affiliate with our own lineage, the earliest species of Homo. And Homo erectus was gone, not so long, still a member, but was essentially already extinct uh, on our planet. And so we have a period of time in which the Neanderthals are present in Europe and Western Asia, but as we'll see in a second, they survive alongside other groups elsewhere that more, uh, more directly reflect ancestry shared with us. So let's look for a moment at a Neanderthal skull. This is one of the best known examples, about 50,000 years old, from a site in France. And one of the most obvious things that you can see in the Neanderthal skull are the dramatic, massive, double-arched brow ridges that separate the face from the brain case. The brain case itself 
It's a spherical, almost globe-shaped enclosure of the very large brain. As I mentioned, the brain is the same size, if not bigger, than the folks in this room. The mandible is chinless. And perhaps most unusually, the face has been drawn out from the brow ridges, from the brain case, in a most peculiar way. The way I usually explain it to my students is this. Imagine your facial skeleton is made of silly putty, or maybe if you want, saltwater tap. And grab your face by the nose, and pull it out, but leave the cheekbones attached to the side of the skull along the zygomatic arches. So that as you pull, the cheekbones, which in us face like this out from the upper jaw, eventually begin to turn like this, like swept back wings of a jet fighter or something like this. So that if you lay a pencil down across the face beneath the, the eye orbit of a Neanderthal, that pencil would touch bone on one flat plane from the side of the nasal opening all the way out here to the cheek arch. The face goes like this instead of like this, as it does in us. And note also the right angle that the nasal bones make as they jut out from the brain case. Peculiar. There's no primate on the face of the earth, living or extinct, that ever had a facial configuration like this. Very unusual indeed. And here we can get a nice contrast between another French Neanderthal around 60,000 years old uh, with the skull of a 20th century uh, modern human. And you can see the differences in the shape of the brain case, the massivity of the brow, how the face has this beaked, drawn out uh, projection from underneath the brow ridge, etc. Here's in the, in the modern human, we can see a lovely chin developed, a very high, vaulted, smoothly rounded brain case, no brow ridges, etc. And here's what's cool. We see exactly the same configuration in skulls from populations that lived as long ago as 110, 150, 160,000 years before the present, at the same time the Neanderthals were living in Europe. This is a specimen from the Middle Eastern site of Kafsa. You can see the well-developed chin, the very weak brow, and the very high, evenly done brain case, relatively flat face. Uh, compared to what we see in the Neanderthals. Very, very different. Note, this specimen is much older than the Neanderthal. Much more modern, but much older. If we look at Neanderthal bodies, we also find some fascinating contrasts. For example, Neanderthal limb bones are extraordinarily heavily built, reflecting very, very strong mus muscles that attach to them. They also had very short forearms and shins compared to you and me, uh, as shown in uh, a modern human skeleton here. Their fingers and toe bones were extremely robust. Their pelvises were extremely wide, which has something to do with the unusual uh, cone-shaped uh, shape of the rib cage compared to the barrel-shaped rib cage that we see in humans. And it turns out that a lot of these characteristics are known to vary in human populations today according to climatic conditions. For example, humans today tend to have stocky, low, wide-built bodies, especially across the middle here, in relatively cold conditions. And it turns out that Neanderthals indeed live in relatively cold climates. I mentioned that already. They lived on the edge of glaciers in, uh, in Europe uh, during the, the Ice Ages. And we see here a reconstruction of global temperature based on greenhouse gases preserved in ice cores in Antarctica, which yield a faithful record of uh, 